Nana, what a unique pleasure this is. Thank you so much for having me. I'm in amazed. Your home. I'm amazed that you should come here today of all days. <laughs> Indeed. It's great of you to come. I appreciate it very Not much. Not at all. Thank Nana. you very much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. And, uh, and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you mm. very much indeed. I yes. appreciate that. Uh, you, you have a lovely home. Uh, it's my second time here, and I, okay. I was just saying earlier how uh, I'm always struck by the elegance of this place. Uh, Madam Rebecca. Indeed, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. But this is, in so many other ways, home. This is Nima. That's right. Know, where, where you grew up. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, it's your 72nd birthday. It's quite a life you've lived. Um, I know that even with a whole day, we can't talk through all of, of the highlights of such a life. But mm. uh, let's, let's touch on a few of them. Uh, let's start from the beginning. You, know, you grew up in this home that was essentially the headquarters of an emerging political party. What was that like? First of all, it wasn't here. That house where it was, was uh, the other side of Accra, the old Accra, Koliwoko, yes. uh, Betty House. That was the name of the house. That's where, uh, even though I was born in Swaraba, my father had moved to Betty House at the time when all the big events took place. So 1948 was some of my very first memories. They coincided, or they, uh, they were made by the 28th February riots. Mm. Um, they took place just before I was four years old. Wow. Yes. And I remember that was like a turning point in my life because there were so many people who were coming in out of the house, my father, Grandpa Dankwa, Uncle Chebi, all of them moving around, going out, coming in. And I knew something really dramatic had occurred. Um, even though I was a little four-year-old, I could, I could feel it. Yeah. And um, very excited. I was yeah. very, very excited about the events. And uh, also thinking that somehow or other, whatever it was that uh, my father mm. was doing, which brought this excitement and all these people, was something that uh, I would like to do. Mm. And that was my little mind working at the time. Yeah. I like to do when, when, when I grew up, as it yeah. were. But it's, it's the first really clear-cut memory mm. that I have of life was mm -hmm. that occasion. The, and I remember that many of the meetings mm. that the UGCC leaders used to have took place there. I even remember as a little boy sitting on Nkrumah's uh, Lab and, uh, and, yeah, and all that. <laughs> they all came, 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 came around the house and were huddled in meetings. And my mother going in out of the kitchen, fetching water to drink, making tea, and all of that. I remember that vividly, and hmm. um, and being, as I say, extremely excited by the fact that all these things were taking place around, uh, in the house. So you were quite conscious that your house is, was different from the typical Ghanaian home. I don't know what the conscious of that, but I just knew that there was something unusual about what was taking place. I mean, you're four years old, uh, and you're trying to you know, take your first steps towards mm. consciousness yes. and understanding what is going on, and uh, you just re recognizing that something unusual, because up to that moment, the house had been more or less quiet. Not quiet, I mean, uh, because of who they were. There were mm. always people in and out, but it didn't take on the dimensions it took after the 28th of February and uh, recognizing that something unusual was going through the house. So that was where we were and it was, um, it was, it was very much a formative experience for me, I think. Uh, subsequently, yeah. you know, I don't know, the, the, the psychologists talk about stream of consciousness <laughs> and all that. It may well have been that that had, had a big impact on me subsequently. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. And then you grew up, uh, went to school, and at some point made a decision you wanted to be a lawyer? Yeah. Difficult. It took, it took some doing because um, my father was a very famous lawyer. Mm. And I always felt, I felt for a long time that uh, I put myself at a disadvantage in going into the same <laughs> profession. People will be always making reference to him and probably comparing you unfavorably and all of that. So it took some time. But at the same time, uh, he, was, he encouraged me to read something other than law at university. 
we felt that for lawyers, it would be good for them to have as broad an education as possible. So uh, that's how, it's one of the reasons why I read economics at Legon. Mm. And then afterwards, I decided that, yes, after all, um, I was going to be a lawyer. Even in that, it took something uh, for that to kick in. I probably won't remember this. There was a very famous case in the late 60s involving a newspaper which was then called the Legon Observer. Mm. It was a paper which all these famous uh, academics, Bachelor Folsom, the Alchumessi, uh, Du Bois Hine, Johnson Ridd, who were, they founded this newspaper after the coup of 1966 mm -hmm. called the Legon Observer. And it used to be, you know, very much compulsory reading for everybody. Mm -hmm. They wrote the an article, paper. yeah, mm -hmm. well, yeah, National mm -hmm. Affairs. It yeah. was a, I think it was called the, 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 they called it the Legon Society of National Affairs, yeah. who were the publishers of the oh, Legon okay. Observer. Wow. And they wrote an article on a case involving Henry Jabba. Henry Jabba had run foul of the law in Nkrumah's time, and his case, and he had been, I think, convicted, and his case was now on appeal to the Court of Appeal then. And uh, I, I think there'd been an undue delay. So they wrote an article, uh, I remember it called uh, Justice Delayed is Justice Denied, which is one uh. of the aphorisms, and went in and made very critical remarks about the administration of justice in Ghana mm -hmm. at the time. My father then was Chief Justice. He didn't take kindly to the article, and neither did the then Attorney General Victor Usu. Mm -hmm. So they decided to charge the Gone Observer, uh, the people responsible for scandalizing the courts. Okay. Yeah, brought them to court for contempt of court. Mm. And I decided to go to court to listen to the proceedings. The defense lawyer for the Legon Observer was Joe Randolph, mm. who subsequently became attorney general and he himself was a very famous lawyer, yes. advocate. And Victor Usu came to court for the, for this, for the, for the, state. the state. I mean, I know, you, you would not have had the opportunity, but watching him in court, was something absolutely extraordinary. His command of English, of the mastery of the court and his procedures and the sheer quality of his advocacy. And I said to myself, no, this is what I have to try to be like and do. So I was heavily influenced by his performance in that case. When the case was over, I told my father that I think I was now ready to try and become a lawyer. And he agreed. And so I went back to England to the ends of court and became a lawyer. That, wow. That's it. But it was, it was a very big moment in my life, that case. The, um, and, the, and the inspiration that I got mm -hmm. from, from watching one of the great advocates of our history perform. In fact, both of them, but especially Victor Usu. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, I, I was trying to find out, um, I was reading all these profiles of you before I came. And I noticed one thing they all have in common. None of them mentions which law school you went to in England. I was at the Inns of Court. Ah, right, okay. The Inns of Court is a law school. They have ah. a law school at the Inns of Court. Okay. I was a member of the Middle Temple. Mm. Yeah. You can be a barrister by going... The English training system is a bit different from America because yeah. they don't have a law school in the basket. The Inns of Court, the four Inns of Court, Middle Temple, Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, Inner Temple, get together and have a law school where they train barristers. Mm. And then the Law Society also trains solicitors. Right. But that's where you come to. So okay. you're called to one of the inns in England. Mm. So I was called to the Middle Temple, like my father had been in ah, his time. Yeah. See. So do you get a choice of this? Did you want to be called to Middle Temple? Is that what well, you, you can Well, you can choose which inn you want to belong to. OK. Yeah. A long, long time ago, in the, in the old days in England, that is how the, the, the lawyers were trained. They sat in, and followed the activities of the lawyers. And these inns, after they go to the court in the Old Bailey and stuff, they would come 
to these is where they would eat and drink. And the younger people who were interested in the law would listen to the, to the practitioners. And that is how they then learnt about the law. And that is how the whole culture and tradition and history of the inns as the gateway to the profession began. Mm. Up till today in England, you still have to eat what they call dinners mm. as part of your training. I mean, you pass the exams, but you're required to eat a certain number of dinners. It was eight terms of dinners before mm. you could be formally called, just to make that tradition. That's why they're called the Inns of Court. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. It's a great system. Uh, That's it, an interesting it system. makes you carry the tradition along it, with you, doesn't it? It's interesting. It? They're very strong about tradition in yes. England, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, let's talk about your law career. Uh, it's, it's one of the most prolific and, uh, and most celebrated. There are so many people who have come through you and are now prominent lawyers in their own rights. Uh, there are so many examples. Yoni Kolendi is the one that comes to mind every time I think about it. And there's something I've noticed about them. They all tend to carry these handkerchiefs <laughs> in, their, in, their, in their cuffs. What is that? Uh, well, it's a habit that I had, which I myself picked up from my father. Right. And that's where he carried his hand. And in the end, I think... If you do it, you find it's really quite convenient. I mean, if you need to use the handkerchief, it's very easy to pull it out of, out of your cuff there, rather than going into the pocket. Yeah. So he had that habit, and I picked the habit from, them, from him. And I think that these, some of the younger lawyers who came into my chambers also picked it up from me. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. I mean, you've, you've noticed they do it, right? They do, of course. Have you I've asked any of them, why are you copying uh, me? Well, it's obvious. So there's no need to ask. <laughs> it's obvious that that's what they're doing. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I had a conspiracy theory of my, of my own that, you know, it's how you identify each other. You know, in a dark room, you're looking for your colleagues and you look up for the guy who has a handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that, that, that's really what... Actually, I believe, really, it's something that came from the military. Oh. Yes, the uniform is very tight on soldiers, so if you needed a handkerchief, a lot of them preferred to put it here, uh, which would not disturb mm. the look of the, of, of the attire, but at the same time was easy to get at. That's my understanding, mm. but, I, but what I do know is that it was a habit of my father, which I then also took up, Wonderful. and it has been passed on to some of the people <laughs> who came to my Indeed, yeah. and it'll probably keep being passed on Absolutely. for many years. Absolutely. Now, talking about the influence you have had on, on lawyers of this caliber who are still you know, at the top of their game in, uh, in, in, in practice in Ghana, were you conscious that you were building a stable? Were you conscious that you were creating a certain generation, if you will, of, of, of lawyers? I wanted to help. I was, I was conscious of that, and I thought if, if through me others could also, you know, get on the ladder of, of success in the profession, it would be good. Uh, but um, I'm quite sure whether creating a state, certainly thinking that uh, whatever, whatever had happened to me uh, in the profession, if I could find some way of passing it on to others and assisting them also to come to grips with the profession, and, and succeed in it, it was good. Both in terms of values as lawyers, as well as, of course, in the quality of their work as, 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 as lawyers. Yeah. I'm very happy. Yuri Colin is one of, of the names and is one that is, you know, I'm very, very proud and happy. But there are lots of others. Sophia Kufu, yes. who is now a very important voice in the Supreme Court, was in my chambers. In fact, was my very first junior. Wow. When I began, I began practice, uh, and there have been lots of others. Philip Allison, who's now the controversial, Joe Gatti, who became Attorney General. They were all Frank Davis, a whole lot of them. So, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your personal interests. It's, 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 it's an irony. Uh, public figures uh, tend to have so little known of their private lives. And I don't actually know what your, what your hobbies are. What do you, what do, you do for fun? Um, I read a lot. I like reading, especially biography mm -hmm. and history. I also read a lot of novels, modern as well as classical, traditional, of all sorts. And, uh, 
generally I'm, I'm a big believer in literature, mm. in history, love the arts. I'm very much into music, mm. popular music as well as more classical music. I listen. I came from the generation of Motown, so oh, yeah. I'm a firm uh, uh, fan of the Supremes, uh, Temptations, oh, wow. yes. You have it all, uh, Teddy Prendergast and all of those people are very much a part of my, so I listen a lot to music. I love cinema. Mm. In fact, there was a moment in my life that's what I wanted to do was to be a film director. Really? Yes, yes, I wanted to. Yeah, really? <laughs> yes. Well, there you are. No, no, no. Uh, but you may be nearer to it. I'm now a little bit beyond those choices, but you still have those ahead of you. Never too late. Never that's too a late. fact, but I, I love film too. And uh, yeah, and uh, very much into it. Watch a lot of film. Yeah. Uh, and, and as I said, one thing, I wanted to be a film. I'm also very much into sports. I was going to ask Very you. strong into sports. I'm a big football fanatic. I, I love cricket. I love squash. These were sports that I played. And also watch a lot of tennis and boxing. You used yeah. to box, didn't you? Yes, as a little boy and in, 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 wow. in prep school. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how come, was there, was there any danger of you becoming the next... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I grew up in those areas and therefore saw a lot of those early fighters as a child. Atukwe Klote, yes. Vincent Tokain, London Kid, uh, of course the famous Roy Ankara. Yeah. These were the big, big, big heroes when we were growing up mm. in that part of our crowd. They were in Bukum and Kolwoko was just around the corner from, from, from Bukum. Um, but I enjoyed it. And in a prep school in England, I, I boxed. Wow. I stopped then. But I continued to play the other sports, mm -hmm. cricket, football, soccer, mm -hmm. and squash. Yeah. But there was a period when I was the national squash champion in Ghana here. No way. No kidding. Yeah, really? in the 70s. Yeah. Fantastic. In the 70s. Betcha Benam to whose dad was another very good squash player. We used to play together a lot. Very, very good player. We, yeah, we all used to play at the camp mm -hmm. in those days. And you but, grew up. With, with yeah, them, didn't you? but those are those are those are the main things. As I say, I love I love reading. I love listening to music. I, I, I love the film. I like films and art. I follow a lot of films. Unfortunately, because of time mm -hmm. and and things, I've not been able to follow the development of the film industry like I would have liked to. But then I have you know my daughters who are always there to prompt me as to what the latest good films to see, etc. So I'm reasonably up to date and, and enjoy it very much. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something I certainly didn't know. <laughs> I'm very, really? much into, very much into it. Um, and I've always hoped that somehow, and this is one of the things that I really admire about what is going on in Nigeria, is that they're developing a homegrown film industry, which is beginning to really, you know, take off and have wings. I'm hoping that one day, or soon, we too, will be getting onto it. It's, it's an area of, um, of both art and entertainment. They meet there and in, a, in a very dynamic sort of way. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much for it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Ghanaian actor? I do have a favorite Ghanaian actor. Yeah, but the older ones. But I like David. David, um, David Donto. Donto. Yeah. He, was, he was somebody that I always admired very much. Yeah. Good at his craft, definitely. Yeah. You've talked about your love of sports. I'm sure you still follow football. Do I you do. Have, do, you, do you have a team? I have several. Support? Real Madrid is, uh, yes. is a fair. I, I support Tottenham Hotspur in England. Uh -huh. And in Ghana, I support Asante Kotoko. I am uh, a big, big Kotoko, Kotoko supporter. Yeah, wonderful, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Real Madrid is a side that I've always supported. Uh, when we were young in England in school, was a, it was a period of Real Madrid's greatness. And in first, uh, when their famous players, Alfredo Di Stefano, Ferenc Puskas, Francisco Gento, and those people 
were at the height of their powers. You know, it was you know, the, the football they played is something that still lives in my memory. You know, like I see them. There. But, and you played yourself. Uh, yes, you know, yes, 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 yes. Never. Uh, in those days, it was you, you called, They had somebody they called the inside right, and inside left. Mm -hmm. They are today's midfield players. Right. Yeah, but midfield right side and midfield mm -hmm. player. That was where I was. Yeah. It takes yeah. quite a bit of talent and actually um, intellect to, to play midfield. Uh, yeah. So. That's where always the ones with a little bit of a uh, skill played. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And it was the same then as it is now. Wonderful. But that's where I played. At Legon, I played in the side in which the former president, the late president, Fifi Mills, mm -hmm. was a member of that side. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We played football together. We were in the same house, the same hall mm. together. We played football together. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating how closely interwoven the lives of our political figures are. You, know, you all seem to yeah. know each other, grew yeah, up together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but don't always end up on the same side. Well, that's okay. Yeah. I, that's okay. I think that is how the life thing should be. We shouldn't all think alike. Yeah. There should be some diversity and variety yeah. in, in, in the choices that we make. And we yeah. make the, the choices and that, 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 that make the most sense to yeah. each one of us. Yeah. And today I'm deliberately not talking to you about politics. I mean, there are so many other things that I'm ah. interested in yeah. uh, when it comes to, to who you are. Uh, but just because we've talked about how interwoven lives are, it occurs to me that, I don't know if you'll agree, but it seems that uh, in, in our sort of political setup in Ghana, those at the bottom of the pyramid, the, the, the voters, the supporters, uh, the foot soldiers, they tend to take things a little more seriously than those at the top leadership, who, um, for you, it's, it's a job. Oh, I'm not so sure. I mean, uh, it's a job. I mean, even at the local level, there's a lot of interaction. I mean, when you, there's no constituency that you're going to when, where the main players in that constituency, either at the constituency level or at the level of the polling stations, they don't know each other. Mm. Oh, yeah. The Ghanaian fabric is very heavily interwoven. And at every stage, these interlink uh, inter in linkings and linkages mm -hmm. are very, very, very evident. You go into a house, one of the members of the house is MPP, the other is NDC, yeah. Yeah, you, lots of players, you see places where members of the family are occupying positions in one party, occupy positions in another, uh, and friends especially, mm -hmm. you know, all across. Mm -hmm. So I think that those, those linkages um, they go right from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. Uh, attitudes are what are, is, is important, I think. Um, I, I, I don't see that, you know, you, you're bound to get enthusiasm, mm. which sometimes can get out of hand, mm. unfortunately. But then the issues that are there in politics sometimes require, you know, very heightened enthusiasm. You're dealing with people's lives whether they have jobs to do and how well paid they are, whether they have access to a decent health system, whether they fall ill or a member of their family falls ill, whether they're able to get adequate treatment and adequate care, they're dealing with issues about your access to schools, how well can, how easily do you and your your, your own have access to decent schooling and can you afford it? I mean, these are the critical issues that confront each one of us in our daily lives. Again, for instance, uh, a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to you to get a house to live in or a flat to, to, to rent? Mm -hmm. So those are the issues that come up for resolution mm -hmm. in public debates and public discourse. And they can generate a lot of of, of, of passion, mm. uh, especially when things are not going well. <laughs> like, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. they're not going very well in Ghana mm. at the moment. It makes, it makes for a lot, uh, quite a lot of passion. But I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded that the decision collectively that we have all taken to go down the path of democracy and peaceful political competition uh, is something that Ghanaians will succeed at. Mm. I think it's something that fits easily into our DNA. And, and that is why we have embraced it with such strength these last 20 odd years. And uh, I, I think as we go along, and we're already on the continent, 
there is a perception that somehow or other Ghana is a little special, a little unique. Mm -hmm. We're able to go to the ballot box and change governments in a peaceful manner. One party goes out, another comes in, and, and all of that has taken place without disturbing the structure of our nation and its, and its, uh, its basic institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that is, um, is, 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 is worth preserving promoting and making sure that it becomes the natural core of our lives as Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. It certainly has a great deal of um, appeal. Mm -hmm. we, you travel outside Ghana, people say, ah, your country is a functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. And I take pride in that. I think, it's, I think it's important that we should go down, we should go down that route. I want to encourage uh, Ghanaians, especially the younger people like you, that let's, let's continue down that path. It allows for a variety of views, different approaches to the resolution of common problems, and that interplay of minds, that contradiction of uh, opposing views and conflicting views, most times, out of it, you get what is good for the common, what is good for the, the community, what the common good requires to be done, because several different perspectives have been brought to a common problem. Whenever it's monolithic, mm -hmm. it's unilear, it's one-sided, in the end, um, horrendous mistakes are made, mm -hmm. because only one perspective is brought to bear on a situation. The, the democratic framework is a good framework for Ghanaians. We're naturally argumentative yes. and disputatious. So <laughs> we, yeah, it fits uh, us fine. It fits us it? absolutely well. And I, I, now, it's, yeah. it's, it's remarkable to hear the passion with which you talk about democracy. And, I mean, peppered across your career you know, is evidence of how um, seriously you take it and how, you know, how passionate you are about it. Another person who is... Uh, is who has contributed so much to its, um, you know, its embedded status in our society is the late Jake Obetivilante, uh, a member of your party from the very beginning, one of the founders, and uh, a friend of yours, a person you've known in almost your whole life. Absolutely. He's no more, and the, 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 you know, the, the, the fact is a sad one. But surely there's a lot to celebrate, isn't there? Oh, about him and about his contribution, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of similarity in, in his life and mine. Um, our fathers were personal friends and political colleagues. They were part of the people who founded the UGCC, which is how our modern struggle for independence all began those who met in Sorpond on the 4th of August, 1947. And in the direction and the movement of the UGCC, they were part of the small group of the leadership, particularly the direction. That is the origin of the concept of the Big Six, mm. was that when uh, uh, Aiken Watson, who headed the Watson Commission, that was set up by the then Labour government to look into the disturbances that gave rise to the 28th February and the demand for free independence and that went here. These are the six people which from the records of the UGCC were identified as the directing minds, the principal political personalities of the UGCC. And they are the ones who were therefore arrested by the, the, by the British government and then became the famous Big Six of Ghanaian history. Obecha Binamte's father was one, my father was another. So that's, those are the links that there were between us. They were both lawyers. So from childhood, we knew each other and became very close friends. We even went to the same prep school in England. I went first and he subsequently followed. And we have been friends all our lives, right up till the end. We didn't always agree about, you know, the details and the way to go forward inside the MPP. But he gave everything to the MPP. He was a very successful person in the advertising industry. 
the head of the biggest advertising agency in Ghana, Lintas. In fact, he was uh, uh, the main owner of Lintas and helped build it up to be a really formidable company. So that by the time 1992 came, and then there was the movement for returning the country to, to democratic rule, he took charge of the, the publicity of, of the NPP in formation and in the NPP after it was formally outdoor. And you can imagine, I mean, he had the, the perfect background for it. He was deeply steeped in the values and principles of the tradition, uh, uh, fully committed to it. His father had died in very painful circumstances and in preventive detention before, something that was always at the forefront of, the, of, his, of his experience and of his mind, and was fully committed to, to his values. He was a big believer in the, how the private sector held the key to the economic development and, and progress of our nation. And that was very much part of the MPP mantra. So uh, you're talking about somebody who was a dyed-in-the-wall MPP person who made a huge contribution to getting the party going. He tried, and uh, people are forgetting today, tried to be national chairman a long time ago. Yeah, he's the one who stood against Peter Alayajete. Right. Uh, yes, he did. Lost, lost quite badly. And then decided to work his way from the bottom, as it were, and became contested for Greater Accra Regional Chairman. He won that. And that was the beginning of his upward movement in the party. In 2000, after he had won the flag bearership, the then candidate, J.A. Kufo, chose Obeche Pilante to be his campaign manager. Uh, and together with him and with others, and then in charge of the party leadership, Odoi Sykes, the chairman, uh, the, the, the then general secretary, Dan Boche, and the people in uh, uh, President Kufo, uh, the then candidate Kufo's entourage, they were the people who basically drove the, the party's uh, uh, activities towards the victory of 2000. So he has that place, if you like, in the folklore of the MPP as a campaign manager who took us to, to, to off. After that, he became a minister in President Kufour's government, his first minister for presidential affairs, his first chief of staff. He went on to other ministries, I think information, as well as uh, tourism. And, uh, and then uh, was one of the 17 who tried after Kufour left uh, the thing, 70. <laughs> After that, um, uh, we lost power. He decided to continue his work for the party and won the, 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 the national chairmanship position in 2010. Yeah. You know all the things that happened. He joined me and uh, Mama Dubaumia to make the petition. The famous, the now famous petition to the Supreme Court over the conduct of the 2012 election. A couple of years later, when the uh, the party uh, held elections for uh, chairman, he tried again, but unfortunately for him, he couldn't make it. But he continued to be very active in the background in terms of ideas, counsel, helping make contacts. Uh, for, for the party, he was very, very much on board. His, 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 uh, you can imagine, this is a lifelong comrade, a lifelong friend, and then a lifelong comrade and colleague. So for me, his passing away has been particularly difficult. And, um, but you, you take comfort in the fact that we are all... Hmm. Heading in one direction. We are heading in one direction, yes. Uh, and that's the, you know, quite, uh, quite a while. No, um, I don't know how long. I think the last three or four months. Yeah. Um, if, if he'd been around, would, uh, would he have had a, a role in your campaign? Team? Oh, certainly as an advisor to me, no two ways about it. And uh, he, I mean, he was that in any event. Uh, even when he was in London, we would call, he would call to make suggestions as to what we should do about this or do about that. Yeah. So, and, and that, 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 that would have been the case yeah. all the way through. Won. Uh, the same, too. Absolutely. I don't know about that, but uh, you certainly would never cease to be an advisor to me and to be somebody whom I would turn to for very, very uh, serious and considered opinions about everything. He was very committed to our cause. 
He felt that uh, the MPP was the party that could really bring progress and prosperity to Ghana and that it was important that at any one stage we make sure that the MPP was in shape to assume that uh, historic mission. Great loss. Great loss. Very great loss. Do you feel that there are others in the political space who are more charismatic than you? And that is perhaps what is being translated as a certain... I don't level. know what more charismatic, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, yes, the ultimate, the ultimate step that I have wanted to take has not come off. But I think that my political career has been a reasonably successful one so far. Uh, I was one of those who helped the MP, found the MPP, brought MPP out of opposition into government. I occupied a uh, very high office in the MPP government and to my understanding discharged myself credibly, creditably, both as Attorney General and Foreign Minister. Out of 17 people who strove to succeed President Kufour, I was the one whom the, the, the bulk of the MPP uh, supporters chose. The three times, the two subsequent efforts that I have made for the MPP leadership, I have won them by very decisive margins. The last time it was almost unanimous, mm -hmm. the party support. So I don't know when you say more charismatic or whatever. Whatever it is, people, certainly within the party, there's been a lot of, of support, solid support for me both in 2007 and in 2010 and again in 2014. And um, the losses, assuming even we don't go into this question about the integrity of those elections, the losses that have been subject to both in 2008 and 2012 were very narrow. Mm. Mm, so, I mean, uh, virtually 50 50 percent 50 percent of the Ghanaian election were prepared to take their chance with me I think that that suggests a political uh, personality that has considerable appeal and, and, and support across the nation I mean, when I was asking that, I wasn't even thinking about performance, but it's, it's really important that you made that uh, you know, point clear that by no means can anyone consider you to have failed at politics. Yeah. But I was thinking more about just your persona and how people from afar who don't have the privilege of coming close to you, how they must consider you know, your personality to be. And uh, they only have comparisons of people who have stood in similar spaces to you, like former presidents or current presidents. Uh, you take uh, former president Kufo, and he had this persona of the gentle giant, and you can see what brought that about. Uh, you take uh, former president Rawlings, and uh, he had that um, uh, persona as a firebrand, but never arrogant, surprisingly. Uh, you know, uh, scary, you know, passionate, and all of that, but never arrogant. And then you have um, former President Mills, Yasun uh, current President Mahama, who's considered to be this communications expert, if you will. When people look at you, what do you think the, the, the label is that they apply to you? I, see, I think basically somebody who cares, who's interested in the struggle of the Ghanaian people, and is therefore prepared to get involved. That's what I see. I mean, President Mills was in exactly the same situation as me. He lost two elections okay. on the trot before winning the last one, the third one, very, very narrowly. Um, so how the, the idea that somehow or other it is this image, and his image was one of somebody who was relatively, you know, ineffectual, couldn't do it. Well, and, and that was the, the reasons that were given for his losses, both in 2000 and 2004. He was transformed into a Sumjini for the purposes of 2008 and won with it. Um, I think that many of the tags that were put on me, uh, belligerent, uh, 
prepared to bring war to Ghana. An arrogant man wouldn't accept. I think a lot of that has been dissipated by my own actions. In 2008, in an election which was on a knife edge, readily accepted and got the party to accept the outcome so that the peace and stability of our country could be preserved. In 2012, once again, in a very contested election, in a contested court case, stood for the peace and stability of the country and not my own personal interest. I think those things are, are, have given me a strong image in the, in the minds of the Ghanaian people. We will see in this election to what extent that image is working. Mm -hmm. But the extent, to the extent that I've always been out there protesting injustice, out there insisting on the correct things being done in Ghana, that we want a Ghana that was free of tyranny, free of dictatorship, of one-man rule in Ghana, that we wanted a Ghana where the economic performance of our country would make it possible for ordinary people to have a better standard of living than what they are now. Those are the images, I think, that are very strong in the minds of Ghanaians. And that is why, uh, even at this advanced stage of myself, I continue to be a very relevant figure in the politics of our country. Mm -hmm. We will see at the end of the day what the Ghanaian people have to say mm -hmm. about me and about my opponents when, when the election of November is. But I'm confident. I'm confident. And I think that the image, I, th I think that the, the arrogant image is, a, is an image which has been deliberately foisted by a few people. And mm -hmm. it is by no means representative of the image that I had mm -hmm. of, of me in the minds of, of ordinary Ghanaians. Now, uh, a former president, and I might tell you which one in private, um, said of you that you perhaps have taken more risks, you know, with, uh, even with your life for the cause than many others of you, and many other contemporaries of yours. And I see how true that is, you know, um, you've, been on, you've been exiled and all kinds of things, all for you yeah. know, your, your you know, political uh, beliefs. Are you now at a point where you feel like you've, you've given so much, you deserve to be president? You've no, earned it. No, 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 no. No, you, nobody ever deserves it. You are elected. This is, uh, it's, not, it's not a monarchy. It's not a, a, a process of selection. To, no, it's you, you are elected. If the people want you, they will elect you. So you put yourself out there, your program, your personality, and for the, for the, the views of, of the majority. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have that view of politics. I don't think anybody ever deserves uh, recognition. You, 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 you get it because people think that you can serve a purpose for them. Yeah. So no, that's, that's, that's not my attitude at all. Mm. I think that it's, it's, it is that I have a view of Ghana which I will strive for peacefully as long as I live. I don't accept that we should be in the conditions that we are in Ghana today. I think that the resources of our country, both in the human capital of our nation, as well as the economic resources available to us, properly put together and managed with a vision of how the future looks like, could look like, could have propelled us much, much further down the road of development than what we're doing now. We're talking about prospects in Africa. People talk of Côte d'Ivoire, they don't talk about Ghana anymore. And yet in Kufour's time, when the, the narrative of Africa rising was being defined, Ghana was this poster boy mm -hmm. because of the vision of development that Kufour was implementing. And uh, I believe that if that vision is allowed to take hold of Ghana for a generation, it would do the transformation of our nation which would bring about a radical improvement in the lives of our people. And, and to that extent, I will continue to agitate for that, for that vision. Mm. So, Nana, it's your birthday. 72 years, congratulations. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, so much has been made up of your age and so forth, but we've, we've talked enough about that in the public uh, domain. 
Uh, you've, you've got your family around you. It's a wonderful day of celebration for you. I'm sure as you look back over 72 years, uh, being the older and wiser Nana now, I wonder if there's any advice you would have given your younger self. <laughs> First of all, let me say something about this age thing, because mm -hmm. I, I think anybody who has read history mm -hmm. would know that political leadership has never been confined to any particular age group. Young people have been in, in uh, have exercised high office in their societies, succeeded, others have failed, middle-aged people have done so, old people have done so. You look at West Africa today, some of the outstanding leaders of West Africa are all older than me, next door, Alassane Ouattara, who is the pacemaker for, for development in West Africa today, is two or three years older than me. I thought you well, said he wears a pacemaker. <laughs> no, no, pacemaker in terms <laughs> is of a pacemaker. The, is yeah. a pacemaker in terms mm. of the development of the region. Mm. When you consider what's going on in Cote d'Ivoire and you consider what's going on here, you want to cry <laughs> when you see the difference uh, of countries with more or less the same resources, the same uh, uh, geology, the same morphology as uh, nations, and one is succeeding spectacularly. It is a top prospect for investment destinies in Africa today, we are lagging behind because of poor ma management. Um, the man there is older than I am, Muhammad ba 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 Muhammadu Buhari, who's taken uh, the, uh, control of Nigeria, is a much older man. So, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in, uh, uh, in, in, in Liberia. These are the outstanding leaders in West Africa. Today, they're all older than me. So the idea that somehow or other age can never be a barrier in politics. You can be very young and come to the top very quickly. You can be old and come to the top. It's always a question of how relevant you are at a given period in history. So I, I, it doesn't worry me. And I think that those who speak about age are usually those who are, don't really have much to say. And they're looking for an easy target. And it, 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 isn't substan it can never be substantial. You look at people, their performance, their program, their capacity, and they themselves, what they have done with their lives. That is the mix out of which you draw leadership. You what is the advice? Personal? Doesn't it sometimes hurt you personally never, when people never. take Criticism. such digs at you? No, no, no. Um, we fought for the opening. I'm the, I'm the Attorney General who repealed the criminal libel law. Yes, thank to, you. Yes, <laughs> to make it possible for everybody to speak their mind without fear of the, the knock at night or being dragged before the courts for your opinions. And knowing that it meant that you leave yourself open. If you come into the public space, you leave yourself open to all kinds of, of criticisms and statements, some of them positive and and uh, in, in support, others uh, critical. If you were to worry yourself about it, then you shouldn't be in public, the public space. The statement that if the kitchen is too hot for you, get out of it, is very true about politics. So I don't worry myself about those things. I'm always looking at the positive, what it is that you're bringing on board, what it is that you're doing that can be relevant for, for the problems and the people of your time. What would I advice would I give? I think just, just to strengthen the, the things that have guided me so far. Um, be extremely committed and motivated to whatever it is that you want to do. I think it's, it's absolutely critical in the way in which any person can make the success of their lives. Be committed to your... They say there are two people, there are two types of people. My old boss in Paris, in my, the law firm, an American, very famous American lawyer of the time, Charles Torrum, said there are two types of people in the world. Those who master the sound of other people's drum and those who master the sound of their own drum. I've always been a believer in the latter that you master the sound of your own drum. And that is the advice that I would give to people younger than me. As much as possible, listen to your inner self and master the sound of your own drum. You become a truer person to yourself 
and you become a more authentic person for those with whom you engage because you're being yourself and not trying to emulate others and be what you're not. Each one of us, in God's way, we are different. And that is the beauty of human creation. And therefore, to the extent that you follow your own destiny, to that extent, I believe you will succeed. Now, no, this has been real. Uh, thanks for having me. And well, uh, I'm amazed that you came on such a day. <laughs> and to thank well, you so much happy uh, birthday. for, for, for <laughs> taking the time to come and talk to me and, and engage me in the way you have. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I thank you very much for coming. My pleasure, Nana. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs>